Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to Q1 FY22 Earnings Conference Call of NIIT Limited. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen-only mode, and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation completes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star 10 zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Vijay Thadani, Managing Director and Vice Chairman of NIIT Limited. Thank you and over to you, sir. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, uh, and uh, good afternoon, uh, for everyone, good afternoon to everyone who's here on the call. And uh, thank you very much for your interest and in joining this call. We always enjoy these conversations because they're very educative for us as well. I only hope all of you have been staying safe. And Ladies and gentlemen, we lost the line for the management. We would request you to please hold the line while we join them back to the conference. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for patiently waiting. We have the management back in the conference. Over to you, sir. Yeah, sorry for the interruption. I just uh, I just said that uh, we thank you for your interest in NIT and for being here with us. We hope that you are staying safe and healthy. Uh, in this call, our agenda is uh, to discuss the business performance for the first quarter of the financial year 21-22 and we would also discuss future direction and opportunities and of course be ready to answer all your questions. As usual, we have the whole leadership team available. Uh, Sapnesh Lala, our CEO, would uh, lead this discussion. And uh, then I am available, Sanjay Mal, the CFO, Kapil Saurabh, the head of ah. relations, and uh, Gaurav Ralan, who is also a finance uh, colleague, would be here to help us with uh, all the answers. I also have uh, Mr. Pawar and Mr. Rajendran uh, uh, on uh, on another Zoom uh, on another uh, line, and uh, they would be also very happy to answer questions as and when it uh, becomes necessary. So I just want to make some op very brief opening comments and then hand over to Sapnesh to to talk a little bit in uh, detail. Uh, first, that in a very highly volatile and uncertain environment, um, where many days in the quarter uh, we were under tremendous strain because of the resurgence of the pandemic, uh, the team has de uh, delivered, in our opinion, exceptional results, both in terms of growth and profitability. The second is the results continue to show a remarkable recovery and acceleration enabled by the digital transformation that the company has achieved. Uh, it's been driven by agile and decisive actions of the leadership team over the last six quarters, leveraging the depth and breadth of our experience in learning technologies and strong execution capability that we have demonstrated over the last four decades. Uh, the results also show that these, the, the efficiencies that a digital learning model can deliver uh, can help a lot in building a strong uh, profitability base. So uh, though the journey to global leadership is uh, uh, long, but I think each of these milestones are helping us get closer uh, to where we want to be. So with that, I would like to hand over to Sapnesh to give us a brief of his uh, business performance in this quarter. Then we'll open it up for question and answer. Thank you. Thank you, Sapnesh. 
Thank you. And I would echo your thoughts on the highly volatile and uncertain environments, uh, specifically uh, the, the the tragedy that marred uh, the the beginning of middle of uh, this past quarter, and more than uh, the performance, it also showed how human uh, we can all be and how fragile as well as resilient all of us can be. So. Uh, uh, interesting times, but uh, an exceptional quarter in those interesting times. Uh, so thanks, Vijay, for the kind words. Uh, from uh, an overall perspective, again, uh, uh, disclosure, please note that the results of previous year have been restated for like-to-like -like comparison in accordance with the accounting standards. Uh, let me start with the overall uh, highlights. The revenue stood at uh, 3010 million up 49% year on year and 9% quarter on quarter. Sequential improvement driven predominantly by the CLG business, which I will cover in just a minute. The EBITDA was at 721 million up 196% year on year. EBITDA margin of 24% up 1188 basis points versus the 12% in Q1 last year. Margin was lower quarter on quarter as we started to ramp up investments in an IIT digital and other IP-based opportunities that we are pursuing globally. That was at 514 million, up 78% year on year, and the EPS was 3 rupees and 80 paisas. Please note that the EPS includes the impact of the buyback and the number of outstanding shares for uh, part of the quarter, and IT completed the buyback, as you might know, uh, of 9.875 million shares through the tender in May. Coming to the corporate learning group, with industry-leading performance, the corporate learning group recorded a growth of 47% year-on-year in Q1 and continues to drive improvement in performance for I'm sorry to interrupt, Ms. Alana. We cannot hear you at the moment. Ladies and gentlemen, request you to please stay connected while we check the line for this management. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for patiently waiting. We have the management back in the conference. Over to you, sir. Uh, sorry, sorry for the technical difficulties. Uh, I was just starting to talk about the uh, corporate learning group. Uh, I'll restate uh, some of the things I, am, I may have said earlier. Uh, the revenue was 2,633 million, up 47% year on year, and 12% quarter on quarter. Constant currency terms, the revenue was up 45% year-on-year and 11% on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis. EBITDA was at $772 million, up 148% year-on-year and 14% quarter-on-quarter. EBITDA margin was at 29%, up 1,185 basis points year-on-year -year and 62 basis points quarter-on-quarter. -quarter. 
strong sequential growth predominantly driven by an expansion in share of wallets of a number of existing customers, accelerated ramp up of uh, some of the new customers we acquired over the last four quarters and strong volumes in the North American real estate business. The company saw significant expansion in two existing customers, both large technology majors. Uh, the, the, the North American real estate uh, market is seeing some normalization now, uh, though I would say that uh, the, the, the demand for real estate as a career continues to be higher than it was during pre-COVID times. During the quarter, NIT added three new MTS customers, all in the life sciences space. One, a large pharma major, second, a large medical devices company, and third, a large healthcare insurer. The MTS tally now stands uh, at 59. The revenue visibility reached 298 million at the end of Q1. The margins continue to remain high, uh, driven by the growth and improved leverage of fixed costs, better product mix, higher productivity, and continued work from home and no travel expenses, as well as the full impact of cost optimizations achieved during the last year. So several of those optimizations have continued. We are seeing a target earning group emerging from the COVID-19 lockdowns. Uh, as we pointed out earlier, this is likely to lead to some resumption of uh, costs and investments that we've deferred uh, over the last few quarters uh, as things start opening up. In our skills and career business, Revenue for the quarter was 378 million. This was up 62% year on year. This was down marginally quarter on quarter due to the impact of seasonality and some of the impact of the second wave of the pandemic which hit the country starting uh, early April. Uh, the stack route and TPAS products continue to see strong recovery given the strong hiring sentiment in the IT segment. Uh, we see uh, a multi-year growth cycle in demand for digital talent as businesses increase adoption of digital to service their customers globally. Our pivot to a digital delivery model last year uh, has since been working uh, and we've been working on ensuring that uh, we can help our learners achieve desired out outcomes through our digital platform. We see this business as a strong edtech platform for digital talent transformation for both individuals as well as corporations and have proven out this model over the last few quarters. As we shared in the previous call, we are accelerating investments and in ramping up the consumer business in India. In Q1, we invested in strengthening the management team and expanding the product portfolio as well as made investments to make our digital platform a stronger and a stickier platform. We also introduced a number of new products, uh, including programs for 5G, uh, cloud technologies, cybersecurity, game development, data sciences, and uh, full stack engineering. As a result, the EBITDA was a negative 51 million during the quarter. Investments in marketing are being accelerated in Q2 so that we can take full benefit of uh, the season as well as uh, grow the revenue run rate uh, for the second half of the year. Overall, NIT has achieved significant transformation over the last six quarters across both, both of its businesses. CLG is a top five global managed training services player with industry leading growth margins and return profile. The target market provides multi-year growth potential due to the large spends and low penetration of outsourcing. New business models are leading to disruption and an IIT is well poised to take advantage from these disruptions. The skills and career business is transitioning to an ed tech business engaged in servicing the rising demand for digital skills by both individuals and corporates. We believe the company has the necessary ingredients for value creation, a differentiated delivery ped pedagogy for deep skilling, with proven outcomes, a strong brand, innovative business models, and a strong balance sheet. We continue to believe that more companies would adapt, uh, adopt learning outsourcing post the pandemic, as we have seen in the past, as econ economies have 
come out of recession, they tend to outsource more. And we think that uh, this demand will pick up as uh, the economies and the companies come out of recession. The second, the demand for digital talent uh, or uh, talent that is trained on digital skills will continue to grow globally as uh, most organizations go through the acceleration in digital transformation. From a balance sheet perspective, as uh, I mentioned earlier, and IT has completed this, its second buyback during the quarter. Our balance, balance sheet metrics continue to be strong, uh, excluding the impact of buyback. The net cash position improved quarter on quarter by about uh, 1,000 million or 100 crores. The DSO also improved to 52 days as of June 30th compared to 54 days as of March 31st. We uh, are continuing to pursue investment opportunities, both organically and inorganically, given the strength of the balance sheet to drive growth across uh, different dimensions, including, but not limited to, continued expansion of a corporate business through expansion of, uh, from a geographic coverage perspective, from expansion with respect to capabilities, as well as customer segments. Achieving leadership in digital talent transformation through NIT Digital and Stack Group are also key agenda uh, points for organic uh, investments. Uh, we continue to pursue an inorganic uh, strategy uh, that could help us accelerate our growth path on the dimensions that I mentioned earlier. Uh, with that, uh, Vijay, uh, did you want to spend just a minute on uh, the completion of the buyback process over this past quarter? Yes. Yeah. So as uh, ladies and gentlemen, we lost the line for the management. Request you to please hold the line while we join them back to the call. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the management back. Over to you, sir. Yeah, uh, once again, apologies uh, for the disconnect. Uh, 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 Sapnesh asked me to talk about the buyback process. I think the process has been completed successfully, uh, absolutely on time and schedule. Uh, the buyback price was 240 rupees per share. The total buyback amount was 237 crores. We bought back nine point, the company bought back 9.875 million shares, which is about 6.97% of equity. And the uh, uh, tendering route was there, and uh, there was a reservation of 15% of buyback amount for small shareholders, which was uh, also uh, oversubscribed. And uh, therefore, uh, uh, accordingly, the allocations were made. So it's been a successful process. Uh, I have nothing more to add. With this buyback, I think 68% uh, of the free cash after uh, the divestment uh, has been distributed. And, uh, and uh, therefore, uh, all future plans as and when they arise, we would uh, be sharing with the shareholders. So I don't have anything more to add in that. Sapnesh, uh, you may want to just open it for Q&A because we have had a couple of interruptions. Thanks, thanks, Vijay. Uh, you're right. Let's open it up for Q&A, Margaret, and uh, let's see uh, uh, if, if we can spend the rest of the time on Q&A. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on the touchstone telephone. 
If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handset while asking a question. Anyone who would like to ask a question, please press star and one at this time. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. The first question is from the line of Ashish Agarwal from Principal India. Please go ahead. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, so a couple of things from my side. First of all, on the corporate learning side, this revenue visibility of $298 million. Uh, over how many years is this uh, uh, revenue you are looking to accrue? That is one. And secondly, on the margin side, um, uh, we are now at almost 29% margins uh, even in this quarter. So, and we have indicated that we will increase the spending, etc. now going forward. So how should we look at the margins in the corporate learning business? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks. Uh, uh, can you say your first question, the visibility, 298 million? I think uh, the way to think about visibility is that that's the visibility that we have for the balance of our contracts or the balance contracts with the 59 customers uh, who are active. Uh, that's what we have. So uh, it is not the next three years or two years or one year. It is uh, the, uh, uh, the contract visibility that we have for the balance of the contracts for the 59 customers that we mentioned. So for example, uh, uh, a couple of our large customers, our com contracts are coming up for renewal. If they were to re renew for three years, we would add three years worth of contract visibility uh, uh, to this number on behalf of those customers. Uh, I would also add that our typical contracts tend to be between three to five years and uh, uh, or I would say 80% of the contracts are three years, the balance 20% would be five years. Uh, and and uh, what you, you had a second question was around uh, margins uh, for the corporate business. Uh, the last time we had guided that our, our margins will be uh, upwards of 20%. Uh, we had said about 20% uh, plus. Uh, I think uh, we are staying with the guidance, but we feel that we might, may be able to get benefit of uh, uh, operating leverage uh, because we provided for the investment uh, already uh, for the year. So we might get advantage of 100 uh, or 150 basis points because of operating leverage, which would start showing up. So uh, I would say uh, we would retain the guidance from the past, but add uh, maybe 100, 150 basis points uh, uh, as benefit from operating leverage. You got it. Thank, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone who would like to ask a question, you may press star and one. The next question is from the line of Saurav Shah from AUM Fund Advisors. Please go ahead. Hello, sir. Congratulations on a great set of numbers. Okay. Question on the corporate learning group. Uh, so what place is the market going, you know, either in terms of new requirements like legal compliance, etc., or in terms of, you know, higher market share because of companies outsourcing their own internal learning to players like yourselves? How fast is the market going? And, you know, how do you see the, in that these are the faster growing places which is relevant to, you know, your own product offering? So, um, uh I think the way to look at the market is by looking at the spend that most corporations do on their employees. Uh, this spend has uh, had gone down in a significant way during the pandemic, but it's starting or it's projected to grow in the uh, uh, mid single digits uh, on a year on year basis. So if you were to look at a very macro picture of corporate uh, learning spends, they're likely to grow in the mid single digits. Um, but uh, I think your follow-up question is very interesting and that's around the propensity for these organizations to outsource. Uh, as I've said in the past that uh, so far, uh, fewer than 25% of Fortune 1000 organizations 
have outsourced their learning in an appreciable way. So there is a lot of headroom uh, for growth uh, in terms of just penetration. And like I mentioned, uh, even the 25% who have outsourced, they haven't outsourced all of it. So there is significant headroom with respect to those who have outsourced uh, in terms of expanding what they do, uh, as well as those who have not outsourced at all. Uh, so uh, from an overall perspective, there is very significant headroom. In the past, we've noticed that every time the economy comes out of recession, large organizations take a relook or a rethink of their strategy, and more often than not, they choose to uh, start doing, uh, start focusing more on what's core to their business and look at outsourcing what is not necessarily core to their business. Uh, I think in the learning outsourcing space, we are at a point where the IT services was about 25, 30 years ago, where the penetration was not as high as you see it today. So uh, over the next a few years, I expect that the penetration will increase. Also, I think uh, NIT represents a specialist organization uh, who can bring significantly high amount of value compared to generalists, uh, generalist uh, uh, outsourcing organizations. And I think, uh, uh, like our customers, there will be more who will see NIT as a specialist who can bring unique value uh, to them, uh, and they will uh, choose to use an IIT as their outsourcing partner. Thank you, sir. So just uh, going on a little bit more, uh, I know you will continue to add new capabilities, but you know, based on your current offering, where do you think is the sweet spot in terms of growth? As a, is it a vertical? Is it a kind of offering which is you know webinar or more interactive or more gamified? Or where, where is the sweet spot currently which is giving you the most growth? Which they have, for example, a very high probability of concluding contracts uh, you know, of the type which are fostering. Yeah, I think our biggest uh, our biggest capability is to ensure that we are able to deliver against our contracts as a managed service, which really means that when an organization outsources something to us, they can rest assured that they will get equal or better performance compared to what they were achieving. And that's really what creates value. Uh, for us, it's very important to ensure that we show up as a reliable, value-creating partner. That's uh, really uh, what's important and, and what's worked really, really well for us. Uh, we will, uh, uh, as part of our strategy, continue to add capability so that we can help organizations in the most broadest of sense. And, uh, uh, but I think uh, the most important aspect about an IIT that resonates with all of our customers is the fact that they can reliably get high quality, high value day in and day out. And this really came into uh, you know, forefront uh, during the pandemic, uh, in spite of the fact that uh, a fairly large number of and ITNs were affected by COVID, none of our customers uh, experienced a, a slowdown, uh, leave aside a shutdown. Uh, I think that goes on to show how reliable our processes are and uh, uh, how our uh, customers can trust an IIT in delivering against what they have outsourced to us. So last question before I maybe try to come back. Is it possible to get a sense of which are the largest verticals or you know, areas where the current revenues come from? I know real estate, as you said, in Canada was a big recent focus, but uh, overall on an annual basis or from your pipeline of $300 million, where is you know, the largest uh, kind of exposure? Uh, some of our uh, uh, largest segments include uh, energy, uh, uh, BFSI, uh, uh, technology and telecom, and life sciences. Okay, so is it possible to get any split at all, any uh, very high level split? Uh, I would say uh, technology and energy. Uh, technology is the top, uh, followed by uh, uh, energy, followed by BFSI, followed by life sciences. Thank you, sir. I'll try to come. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone who would like to ask a question, you may press star and one. The next question is from the line of Samad Singh from CPF Capital. Please go ahead. 
Good afternoon, sir. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my question was a follow-up to a statement you made, which is uh, only 25% of uh, Fortune 1000 companies currently outsource. But at the same time, I think the overall market growth is in mid-single digits. So can you explain to me the dichotomy on why uh, the market is not growing at a faster rate? Yeah, I think uh, in, the, in the, the simplest way of thinking about it is uh, that uh, uh, learning is a discretionary expense. It is an enabler to business growth, uh, but it, it is one step behind business. Uh, and I think uh, your question is really around uh, why, why is it that IT is growing faster than learning? Uh, I'm, I'm making a guess that's where you're coming from. I think... Uh, IT to a great extent runs business, whereas learning focuses on enabling business performance. And I think uh, it's seen more as a discretionary expense, whereas IT is seen as a mandatory expense. Now, uh, as I've said uh, in the past uh, uh, on such calls, that what we've tried to do, and I talked a little bit about our segmental focus uh, or a sectoral focus, uh, we try to focus on sectors where there is a higher proportion of mandatory training, sectors which are highly regulated, which include energy, life sciences, BFSI, or sectors where there is very high rate of change, like uh, technology and telecom. Okay, and do we have a breakup of uh, the percentage of revenues that fall under regulatory or uh, mandatory in nature? Uh, greater than 50% of our uh, business comes from organizations or sectors that are highly regulated. So would it be safe to assume that greater than 50% of our revenues are regulatory in nature? I won't say that because uh, even the highly regulated organizations have training that is not purely compliance or regulatory driven. And it's very hard for me to tell you how much of it was regulatory versus non-regulatory, but I can say that greater than 50% of our revenues come from organizations that are highly regulated. Okay. Uh, and the, uh, well, one of the uh, comments in the opening statements was that, uh, you know, digital uh, efficiencies have led, led to improved profitability uh, in, the, in the CLG group. And I think in the past conference calls, we've been hesitant to, I put a stake in the ground and say that you know these efficiencies are here to stay permanently. So I was wondering whether uh, you know with the discussions with your clients, whether you've come to any sort of conclusion on whether these digital efficiencies are here to stay permanently, and if they are, you know what sort, what you know part of that benefit will be retained by us, and what part of it sort of will flow to our customers. So I think some of these efficiencies are here to say uh, to stay. Uh, I don't think we will be traveling as much as we used to to deliver training. Also, I don't think we will deliver as much in-person training as we used to. But some of it will come back. Now, exactly how much of it will come back, time will tell. But uh, in, in all our conversations with our customers, some of it will come back, but we are not sure how much. Uh, but time will tell. And uh, that's really the reason why uh, we are saying that uh, uh, we think that we can do upwards of 20% uh, 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 compared to uh, the past when uh, we were in the teams. Uh, and that's because we feel that uh, some of the efficiencies are here to stay. Uh, and just one last follow up to that. So uh, we got it for upwards of 20%. Uh, our quarter one margins are at 29% for the CLG. So does that imply a significant ramp up in costs uh, in the you know, in the next three quarters? Uh, I think it's a combination. Uh, it's a combination. There are really, the way to think about it is there are three uh, things at play here. One is that uh, we are ramping up our own investments so that we can fuel growth. Uh, and those investments started out uh, as we got into Q1, but they will ramp up as we go through the year. Uh, second, uh, uh, like I said, some of the efficiencies will stay, but uh, some of the expenses will go up with respect to facilities, with respect to travel, as things start opening up. Uh, and third, uh, 
uh, like I had pointed out uh, in my opening comments that uh, the real estate market uh, has been at a high over the last couple of quarters and we think uh, that some of it is starting to level off and uh, that will result, uh, that will have an impact to the margins as well. So these three uh, dimensions are at play uh, uh, as we as we look ahead on margins. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Rahul Jain from Dollar Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, hi. Uh, congratulations on a uh, very strong number. Uh, my question is uh, pertaining to uh, the development that we uh, we have uh, seen in last couple of days uh, on the edtech sector, uh, what's happening out in uh, China. So of course uh, it's a bit uh, far fetched at this point. But is there any way we see uh, this as an uh, opportunity in terms of how we would like to shape up our uh, this side of the business and what are the real plan, uh, you know, as we uh, now trying to call it out as tech so what's the real big picture view out here from our So there was a little bit of disturbance on your line, but what I took away from your question was that uh, uh, we saw uh, 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 regulatory changes with respect to education or ed tech business in China and uh, are we likely to get affected by that. Uh, so on that, uh, I think uh, uh, my answer would be direct exposure to China, probably not, because uh, uh, that's not the type of businesses that are getting uh, regulated uh, in China are not the ones that we participate in. Uh, second, uh, I think you were trying to draw a parallel to see whether something like that might happen in India or not. And really there, my view is that uh, a lot of what's happening in China is around K-12, supplemental K-12 education, which creates uh, a lot of stress amongst kids. And that's uh, not a business that we are in. Uh, so uh, I don't see a direct impact, though, uh, you know, uh, time will tell how these policies uh, cross borders. Right. So actually, uh, the, ex the extension to the question was, uh, what is our uh, long-term or mid-term kind of a strategy in this business uh, in the uh, skill or ed tech side, what we want to uh, build? Yeah, I think, I think in the simplest of terms, uh, our focus, as I mentioned earlier, is learning outsourcing, uh, which is predominantly conducted in the United States and Europe. And uh, I don't see... Uh, uh, this move from China affecting that at all. Second, our focus in India is towards early careers, uh, students who are about to graduate from college or who have just graduated from college and joined uh, our corporation. Uh, that's really the market that we are focused on. And again, uh, I don't see an impact of this regulatory change in China on uh, what we are doing here in India. Okay, okay. I was looking from a different context. I'll take that offline. But uh, my another question is uh, from uh, in our uh, corporate learning business, we've definitely seen a significant uptick in terms of the number of new MTS customers we've been adding. So, uh, what? Uh, so, this part of the uh, you know jump from let's say 30, 35 customer to uh, 59 odd now has been very sharp. So. Uh, from this point, let's say we have to go to, let's say, 60 customer to, to let's say, 80, 100 customer, uh, given the lower penetration on the Fortune customer. Then uh, what is the change of strategy required? Is it just like adding more sales people or is there a uh, different capability mix we need to require given that we have a high concentra concentration on four sector? So will that mean that we need to add a lot of capability some diversity of businesses as well. So any color you want to share on that? Sure, I think um, uh, you probably answered the question you asked, but uh, let me provide you color on uh, what our strategy is. Uh, I think uh, from a growth perspective, uh, uh, there are, are three key dimensions which uh, we see as dimensions that can accelerate growth. Uh, the first one is uh, geography 
uh, expansion. Uh, as I've mentioned earlier in uh, similar calls, uh, we uh, are looking at geographic expansions with respect to continental Europe and Latin America. Uh, second is capability expansion. Uh, there are a number of areas that we have identified. We won't go into what those areas are, but there are uh, a number of areas that we have identified where uh, our customers are open to having conversations with us uh, as long as we have top class capability. And those are areas where we are building capability. I know for a fact that there is significant talent transformation that our customers face uh, because of the acceleration of digital and there are, those are some of the areas where we are improving our capabilities. Uh, third, uh, you know, uh, is market segments. Uh, and I think you alluded to that as well. Uh, there are a number of market segments, uh, uh, such as professional services, uh, such as uh, aerospace, such as a number of other uh, uh, market segments where we have some penetration, but not a lot. Uh, and we would like to uh, invest uh, in business development uh, uh, to, to gain uh, penetration uh, in those market segments. Uh, I would remind you that about three years ago, we made an acquisition to get into the life sciences space, and now we have more than 10 customers uh, in the life sciences space. So uh, we are going to pursue both organic and inorganic activities to Build on build capabilities on these three dimensions. Right, right. And just last, if I can squeeze in, I, I, I you earlier you said about some on the profitability outlook. Sorry, uh, I missed your uh, comment. So if you could share in terms of how you expect the profitability in the business, CLS business, panning out over uh, next few quarters or years, whatever you want to share on that. Uh, uh, for, for this year, we think that uh, compared to uh, my earlier guidance of 20 uh, plus uh, uh, percent profitability, EBITDA profitability, you're saying that uh, there is a likelihood of us getting an additional 100 to 150 basis points um, of operating loss. <laughs> okay, okay, fair enough. Thank you. That's it from my side. I think uh, the other thing, uh, while you didn't ask that as a question, uh, I also wanted to uh, say that uh, uh, compared to what we had said in the past, uh, uh, we are uh, starting to see visibility of uh, higher revenue growth. And I think we will be in the mid 20s uh, to higher 20s in terms of uh, revenue growth. And I think some of that will also start showing up on the bottom line, uh, like I said, through operating leverage. Right, right, right. That, that's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Saurav Shah from AEM Fund Advisors. Please go ahead. Thanks again, Sapesh. Uh, Sapesh, just to get a sense of you know, the next uh, eight, 12 to 18 months, would you give us a sense of your go-to market strategy? I know you just mentioned looking at inorganic on the side. But from an organic basis, in terms of what kind of people are you hiring, what kind of other sales efforts you are making, you know, and on the you know more internal side, what kind of product offerings you are developing, either from you know vertical standpoint or you know changing the way you offer the you know the methodology of or access, etc. You just give us a sense of how you are doing that for the next 12 to 18 months, please. Uh, sure. Uh, like I pointed out, there are uh, really three dimensions in which uh, we are looking at. Uh, the first one is uh, ge geographic expansion, both from a business development perspective as well as delivery capability perspective. Uh, and uh, the regions where uh, we are uh, interested in expanding our coverage include continental Europe and Latin America. Uh, those are regions where we have customers today, but there is... Uh, uh, significant opportunity to add new customers. Uh, the second is uh, uh, looking at additional sectors compared to the ones that we already have. Uh, there are a set of sectors which include professional services companies and a number of other uh, sectors where we currently do not have customers, but we know for a fact that uh, there is significant spend that takes place uh, on training. Uh, so there, uh, there is sectoral expansion that we are looking at and for that uh, we are bringing on people who have sig uh, significant experience and specialization with respect to those sectors. 
the third area is uh, like i pointed out uh, answering the previous question where uh, i expect that there is going to be significant talent transformation given the acceleration of digital and uh, uh, that's an area where we can gain market share uh, or wallet share with our existing customers if we build capability and uh, that's an area where so talent transformation uh, it is uh, it has many layers of capability but uh, we are focused on improving our capability and strengthening our offering from a talent transformation perspective so those would be the three areas uh, over the next 18 months or so where we uh, are likely to make uh, investments both organic as well as inorganic uh possible to be a bit more granular sapne in terms of you say you know how many people you are hiring you know given the language challenges i think in some of the geography that you mentioned how you expect to change that any partners any other kind of you know uh, structures any hiring from you know potential customers or how are the other ways you are trying to kind of ensure faster penetration for product registration is not really as essential as it uh some more granularity if you can provide us given the public nature of that call i would i would hesitate to do that because uh, not only our well wishers but our competitors also listen in on these transcripts so uh, i would say uh, uh, i would i would uh, stay at the level that i provide where uh, there is significant investment going on in both business development as well as capability creation so that we can accelerate growth uh, and that's what come uh, not just from a people addition perspective but people addition with respect to significant expertise geography uh, as well as uh, capability creation or okay, capability acquisition next question sabnesh was you know as you kind of expand and build up bigger libraries for these learnings and other things do you expect your gross margins to increase i mean you know where you are just now what would be the variable component for you to develop you know new course material new modules etc how should we look at that you know are there any internal targets for reducing the variable cost on you know new product offerings etc so just to be clear uh, we have we are and have been predominantly a service business and our, our gross margins have tended to be service gross margins now over time we have started blending the service with significant intellectual property investments the first significant one was in a real estate contract uh, in canada uh, we are looking at similar uh, ip uh, related business models which can uh, create a mechanism of blending product gross margins with service gross margins so that we get an overall uplift Uh, this is a last clarification. You mentioned this real estate thing a couple of times. Is that linked to really the you know growth of the real estate market and the industry, or is this something which will continue because it's a regulatory environment kind of dictated change beyond the current you know boom period that the you know both the US and Canada experience? So uh, this is a contract that we entered three years ago. Uh, uh, three years ago there wasn't a boom uh, in real estate business, but it is. Uh, to operate contract, which means that you want to transact in real estate, you have to have a license, and NIT became the exclusive provider of such education uh, in uh, uh, the state of Ontario in Canada. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, but uh, as I've mentioned uh, this time as well as in the past uh, conference calls, uh, uh, there has been uh, a significant uh, ramp up. in interest in real estate uh, careers to some extent because of the pandemic uh, because uh, uh, it is a viable second career for many people uh, but also because the real estate market has been red hot uh, over the last couple of quarters and as you might know anything that's red hot uh, starts to cool off uh, over time and uh, uh, but uh, from an overall perspective from an overall perspective uh, Uh, given the regulatory and license to operate nature of the contract we continue to see we, we should continue to see reasonable demand even if it's off of its peaks that we have noticed in a few four and few one thank you thank you the next question is from the line of amit singh from tpf capital 
Okay, go ahead. Uh, thank you for the uh, follow up uh, on the RICO contract. I believe it's a five plus two year contract. Uh, so what happens at the end of end of the period? Is the IP transferred back to the client, or is it a rebid? Or what happens then? See, we normally don't get into uh, discussing terms of our contracts with customers on uh, conference calls. But uh, like you pointed out, it is, uh, uh, and and uh, a lot of it is uh, client confidential, so we can't discuss it. Uh, but it is a time-bound contract with which has options uh, for uh, for renewals. Okay, and uh, uh, you know I, I'm guessing you can't give the uh, the percentage of revenue coming from this. But when we had signed up the contract, we had said that we expect to generate 15 million dollars uh, of revenue per year. Uh, so are we significantly above that, or are we around that? <laughs> I think you're. Uh, I mean. Uh, uh, I can I can uh, use different words to say to say something that would mean that uh, these are co client confidential uh, uh, numbers and uh, we can't disclose them. And uh, just to get an idea of uh, sort of the growth that we uh, you know the, the sort of the addressable market in in CLG, I think uh, about a couple of years back uh, we were you had stated that we were doing. Uh, we were seeing about 50 RFQs every year, out of which we were participating about 40 of them, and you know, winning 30% of those. Uh, is it the same today, or has that uh, improved significantly, both in terms of the number of RFQs we see every year and our win rate? Um, uh, our win rates have improved significantly. Uh, the total number of RFPs or RFQs actually went down uh, uh, during the COVID year. Uh, but our win rates have improved significantly. Uh, also, over the last uh, year, year and a half, we've seen a lot of referrals where uh, organizations have chosen to work with NIT without actually going into an RFP process. But uh, as, as, as organizations start coming out of uh, COVID-related shutdowns uh, and, and start focusing on uh, their strategy for non-core work, uh, I expect that the number of opportunities will increase. Okay. And, you know, uh, we had made a statement that, uh, I think this was in end of 2018, beginning 2019, that you'd expect to, you know, double our revenues every two, or, uh, every three or four years. Uh, and that was on a, on a smaller revenue base. So do we still uh, stand by that statement or would we temper that down? Yeah, I think uh, we, uh, in, in, in a steady state, uh, from an organic perspective, we think that we can uh, continue to grow at about 20% year on year in this corporate business uh, in steady state. Uh, and um, I think if we were to add inorganic uh, growth uh, uh, possibilities, we should still be able to uh, meet that goal. Okay, thanks. And last question from my side. How, uh, how different or similar uh, is our uh, skills and career business to uh, it is simply not. Uh, I, uh, it is uh, significantly different, um, I would say, from a number of dim dimensions. Um, uh, like I had pointed, uh, I pointed out earlier on this, uh, we, uh, the focus uh, target audience that we have is early careers, which is folks who are either about to graduate from college or who have just graduated from college or who have just graduated and got a job. That's really the audience that we focus on um, uh, as an IIT. Uh, uh, on the other hand, Simply Learn uh, focuses on a slightly different audience. They focus predominantly on working professionals. Uh, second, uh, NIT focuses on deep skilling, uh, uh, which is programs that go on for a fairly significant amount of time and actually transform somebody's skills such that from not being able to do something, they're actually able to do something. So uh, you would uh, uh, akin NIT's programs to say, if you wanted to teach somebody how to swim, a person who did not know how to swim, you wanted to teach that person how to swim, they would spend time with us and we would teach them how to swim actually quite well. Uh, compared to that, uh, I think uh, Simply Learn's programs are focused on upgrading uh, a working professional skills. The person, so for example, a person 
knows how to use Oracle 10, and now Oracle 11 has showed up. So uh, you would learn how to use Oracle 11. So these are programs for working professionals to upgrade their skills. Uh, NIT programs tend to be deep skilling programs that transform a person's uh, ability to do a job. Did that help? Thanks so much. Yeah, very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Shraddha Agarwal from AMSEC. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Congratulations on a good quarter. Uh, a couple of Thank questions. Uh, how should we look at the revenue growth of between CLD? Um, despite a very strong start, we are still maintaining our guidance of uh, mid to high teens growth in CLD. So that would effectively mean that uh, we are talking of a uh, material deceleration in revenue growth uh, starting to increase. So, so I mean, we had also you know, kind of indicated that we had seen volume compression in existing accounts and some normalization of their spend has started to happen. So uh, given that uh, fact, how do we look at uh, the revenue growth trajectory on a Q1 to basis for us? Sure. Uh, so uh, let me just... Uh... Uh, say or repeat uh, what I just said a minute earlier. Uh, we think that the corporate learning business's growth forecast or grow growth guidance, we are upping it from mid to high teens to uh, 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 low to mid, uh, I'm sorry, mid to high 20s. So we are upping the guidance in a significant way for the corporate business, given the strong performance in Q1, as well as uh, some of the visibility that we've had through new customer uh, additions and expansions. Oh, so, uh, in terms of, uh, so are we expecting sequential growth in all the three remaining quarters of the year? Uh, we should get marginal sequential growth uh, over the next couple of quarters. And this is despite volumes in decoding coming up. Say that again. I am not able to hear you very well. No, I'm saying this is despite volumes in the Rico B coming down. Yes, that's why I said that uh, while uh, we'll see some pull off or some leveling off in terms of volumes in uh, the North America retail business, but because of uh, the new customers and the expansions that we've had, we think that we'll see some marginal improvement in, vol uh, in revenue from a quarter on quarter perspective. Sure, so that's very helpful. And how should we look at the growth trajectory in our skills and career business? Uh, the skills and career business for the year should show robust growth. Uh, we expect that the growth will be upwards of 40%. That's on a low base, but on a sustainable, more sustainable basis over medium term, how should we build that? How should we build the growth rates in SMT? I think uh, that that business is going to continue to be a high growth business for the near term. Uh, uh, to midterm, uh, given A, the low base, and B, the investments that we are making. The 20% plus is a reasonable expectation for SMT to grow in the medium term? Yes. Sure. And so uh, I think I missed out on the net cash number. Of, could you help me with that number? Net cash for this quarter, this fast quarter. At correct? the end of one two, yeah. yeah. Uh, Eleven seven one nine million, Aina. Eleven seventy two crores. Eleven seven one nine, yeah. Eleven seventy two crores. That's right. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, this is post buyback. This is post buyback, right? Yeah. That's it for my thank. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone who would like to ask a question, you may press star and one. Ladies and gentlemen, you may press star and one to ask a question. As there are no further questions from the participants, I now hand the conference over to the management for closing comments. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, we've had an interesting discussion. Uh, thank you very much for joining us.
uh, we apologize for the few interruptions that happened, but uh, uh, I, I can see that most of the questions were answered well by Sapnesh. Uh, if there are any follow-up questions or issues, please do not hesitate to reach out to Kapil Saurabh uh, at uh, Investor Relations, and he will be very happy to connect you with any part of the organization that you would like uh, to get your questions answered from. So as usual, we thank you for uh, being here with us. Your presence means a lot to us. And uh, we always learn more from such interactions. And we look forward to your continued guidance, support, and cooperation. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of NIIT Limited, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us. And you may now disconnect your lines.